let me set the scene for you. It's 2013. Breaking Bad just ended its five-season run to become one of the most beloved television shows of all time. A new pope has just been elected, raising questions about how the social stance of a church of 1.3 billion people is about to be shifted. Grand Theft Auto V, probably the most anticipated game of all time up to this point, was finally released for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. And somewhere in between all of this, I'm 11 years old. And while all of the aforementioned events were certainly more popular in the year 2013, and definitely more important than whatever I was doing, there was only one thing that could really captivate my attention. YouTube Let's Plays. I, like many other children, was locked in a veritable content chokehold by YouTubers like PewDiePie, Markiplier, and Jacksepticeye. And even today, videos of 20-something white dudes talking and playing horror games is some of the most successful content that this platform has ever seen. And 11-year-old me ate that shit up. Not only for the wacky personalities and ridiculous jump-scare reactions that were put on display, but also for the games that these videos introduced me to. Games like Amnesia, Penumbra, and Slender. YouTube Let's Plays gave me access to a veritable treasure trove of indie titles that, come to think of it, I probably consumed at far too young an age. Regardless, I played the hell out of these games, ESRB ratings be damned. And my favorite title that I discovered through this wave of content was a game that, like many other indie horror successes, seemed to have come out of nowhere. It was a game called Outlast, and was the first project from a brand new indie studio called Red Barrels. This game seemed to, for lack of a better term, take over the world at release. All of my favorite YouTubers were making videos on it. I knew I had to play it myself with the reception that it was getting, and when I finally did, the game absolutely did not disappoint. I had played other survival horror type games in the past, but this was the first experience that I felt really deserved that distinction. The gameplay was frantic and terrifying, the visuals were stunning, and surprisingly, maintained a sense of tastefulness in spite of the subject matter. Thematically, the game also just had so much going on. From the beautiful presentation of the game's setting, to the dedication to an unconventional run-and-hide style of gameplay, Outlast could seem to do no wrong. The success of the game propelled Red Barrels to the top echelon of developers, and in hindsight, the game has really shaped up to be a true modern classic. Getting here wasn't easy though, and all that someone has to do to tell that Outlast development was troubled is look at the date of its release. Outlast released in late 2013, but Red Barrels was founded all the way back in 2011. So what happened during those two years? If your answer is simply developing Outlast, then, well, you're only really partially right. Indie development, and more specifically, funding indie development, is a complex and stressful undertaking for anyone in the industry. And to say that Red Barrels had it rough in this regard would be an understatement. Ironically, the game about surviving and persevering through insurmountable odds almost didn't survive. To get the full scope of what happened with Outlast's development though, we need to get a closer look at a man named Philippe Morin. A native Canadian, Morin was hired as a game designer by Ubisoft in 1998. He would find a home in game development where, over the next 12 years, he would act as a creative force for companies like Ubisoft Montreal, Naughty Dog, and eventually EA Montreal. His accomplishments in the industry would bolster over this period of time, including recognition for his work on Prince of Persia, Assassin's Creed, and even Uncharted. At this point, Morane's career would have already been considered a successful one by any account, but he was always eager to do more. In fact, him and two of his colleagues had already been in the discussion stages of starting their own indie development company for years. They would not actually be motivated to set out and create their own company for a while though, because doing so involved taking on an immense financial risk. Soon enough though, they received ample motivation to go indie. The experience which pushed them over the edge and into indie development occurred, of course, during their time at EA. Morin was offered the chance to collaborate with his friend and colleague Hugo Delaire at EA Montreal. Delaire, who Morin worked on Prince of Persia with, had recently been chosen to create a whole new IP for EA. Delaire and Morin were enthralled to receive such an opportunity, and believing that this would be one of the biggest projects of their career, put their plans to go independent completely on hold. Unfortunately though, EA did what EA does, and cancelled the project before it could even go through a calendar year of production. 
Dallaire and Morin were rightfully frustrated towards the company, feeling more dejected than ever upon receiving the news that EA was planning to cancel their project. These feelings did not take long to reach their logical conclusion, with the two of them opting to leave EA Montreal to pursue independent development in a matter of weeks. Little is actually known about the specifics of what happened between the fallout with EA in January of 2011 and the founding of Red Barrels in June of later that year. Essentially, all that is known is the span of this period, with it taking Dallet and Maureen only four months to finalize their decision. Now intent to take the risks of indie development head-on, Philippe Moret, Hugo Dallet, and David Chateau, another former colleague, officially founded Red Barrels on June 26, 2011. Their hopes were extremely high, but for each word of excitement on setting out as independent developers, there was an undeniable truth on the back end. And it was that none of their years of industry experience would matter if they couldn't secure funding. In a later interview, Morin stated that he believed his status as an industry veteran would make finding the funding easy, and he told his wife that he would find investors to help get the studio up and running within three or four months. He was very... Very wrong. You mean the right choice here, buddy? Hey, you're the bullshit priests guy, aren't you? And this is one of the scariest things to consider when dealing with indie development as a true industry veteran. Most of these guys are already 30, with a spouse and family that rely on them for support. And such was the case for Moray and his colleagues. And to alleviate some of the stress on their shoulders, they needed to find cash in hand as quickly as possible. To make matters worse, most of their capital was used to create the company, meaning that, in reality, the three-month time frame that Maureen proposed was more of a requirement than a suggestion. Since entirely self-funding the game was now out of the question, this left Moraine and his team with two options, the first of which was to seek funding from a publisher. Unfortunately, this would bind Moraine to working with large studios, much like the ones he left. On the bright side though, it would provide his team invaluable assistance with finances, and would enable the game to be marketed on a broader scale than if they were to self-publish it. After a long and arduous period of looking for such a publisher though, Moraine returned empty-handed. According to Moraine, the publisher route was a bust for two reasons. Firstly, because studios at the time would rather give 10 mobile game developers $50,000 than one indie company $500,000. Secondly, there just wasn't a lot of belief in games like Outlast. Bigger companies were just not seeing a substantial enough return on their investment from single-player action games, and instead were more enticed to pursue mobile games, which were typically a more secure choice for their money. Interestingly, this was not the first time that such a sentiment would be revealed to Moray. He received essentially the same response from Ubisoft while trying to pitch a horror game to them during his time as a designer. And the main takeaway from this is really just that to companies like Ubisoft and EA, at least at the time, making a horror game was risky. Big budget horror games have a habit of massively underperforming, either through failing to reach the intended audience, or by losing that intended audience somewhere along the way. And Conversely, many indie horror games can just explode with popularity and seemingly become classics from out of nowhere. The market for these games was and still is unforgiving and volatile, and it is for this reason that Moraim would never have been able to pursue his dream project before going indie. In short, the development of Outlast was a massive, massive gamble. With no publisher to speak of, there was only one option left for Morin and company to pursue in funding their dream game. The Canada Media Fund. The fund, which grants financial support in the form of loans to Canadian creatives working in visual arts, film, and game-related work, functions with a brutal application process. The company accepts submissions only two times per year, and to make matters worse, Morin found out about the opportunity right before one of the application deadlines. Having no demo prepared, Morain made the difficult decision to delay his application for the next submission period, six months down the line. Morain was confident in Red Barrel's ability to scrape by for a good six months or so. They took a few contracts that the company completed for a bit of change here and there, but it was really barely enough to get them through to the next application date. The team had to feel hopeful about their ability to secure funding, 
as they were uncertain how they would make it if they didn't. More again took the reins, presenting the culmination of his 15 years of game design experience to the CMF. And in a heartbreaking turn of events, Red Barrels was not granted financial aid from the CMF for Outlast when that next application date eventually came. This was a catastrophic blow to Red Barrels' morale. The company was essentially running on fumes at this point, having used nearly all of the money that they had raised from their own savings and loans to continue development. They needed this money to put the game out, and with this decision from the CMF, it looked more and more likely every day that their game would never see the end of development. Even worse, Moraine's seemingly unlimited optimism about the future of their project had started to fade. In his own words, the CMF basically just said, Nope, you don't get it. There was no explanation, no rhyme or reason for why they weren't going to be provided the money, simply that they weren't. At this point, many devs would simply have given up, content to say that they had tried or given it their best shot. Moraine was not most devs though. And in a final gambit, Moraine scraped together $300,000 by himself from friends and family, as well as from his own savings. This money allowed Red Barrels to make it six more months, where their fate would truly be decided at the next application date. Of course, you already know what answer they got. After a grueling 18 months of searching for funding, Outlast finally received a well-deserved $1 million from the Canada Media Fund in early 2013. When Morin was later asked about how it felt to finally pass the application, he joked about how much of his own money he had put on the line, essentially stating that he was thankful to still have his house. One problem still remained for Red Barrels, though. They needed to finish the game. Naturally, the cuts in funding, as well as the time that had to be dedicated to contracting work, had substantially hindered development time. With the CMF's money, though, there was no longer a need to pursue any work that was not pertaining to Outlast's development. The added time also allowed the team to release the first trailer for the game, which was uploaded to YouTube via the official Red Barrels channel on October 17th, 2012. It certainly wasn't much, but at least now people knew the game existed. Going into the new year 2013, Moray and his team would follow up on the trailer with aggressive advertising campaigns. The team ran what can only be described as a marketing gauntlet in 2013, attending PAX East in April, E3 in June, and PAX Prime later in August. This gave Red Barrels a crucial first, second, and third opportunity to put their product into the hands of consumers. And people loved it. The game was an absolute breath of fresh air to those who had been burned out by the repetitiveness of the modern gaming industry. Instead of another modern military shooter or another mobile game, finally there was something original. Specifically, the game's focus on running and hiding was a big hit, which was a surprise to Moraine, who was originally quite stressed about how this feature would be perceived. Outlast was finally being recognized on the global stage as a game to look out for. It caught the eye of so many in the industry, in fact, that even Sony wanted a piece. The PlayStation 4, which had a planned release date of November 15th, 2013, was already looking like it was going to come out ahead in the next console generation. Sony had managed to remain steadily ahead of the competition in console marketing for a time, but its competitors were always looking for ways to gain the upper hand. Specifically, Microsoft had been experimenting with the idea of coupling free games to their online service subscriptions, a practice which Sony was eager to bring to PlayStation. Sony wanted Outlast to be one of their first big inclusions in the new PlayStation Plus Free Games of the Month program, and offered Red Barrels a large, flat fee in order to provide a console port. Things were really starting to heat up for Outlast. The convention circuit, as well as the deal with Sony, really got people talking about this new game. The excitement only grew with the announcement of a release date, September 4th, 2013 for PC, and February 4th, 2014 for PlayStation 4. The selection of September 4th as the release date for the game was, of course, because that was all the time that their finances allowed. Running the convention circuit was expensive, and developing more trailers for the game also took out another chunk of that CMF money. These ventures were an important investment, though, to circulate more hype for the finished product, and their investment would soon pay off, as consumer and media interest 
would provide a wave of momentum for red barrels. All they had to do now was ride it all the way to September 4th. In the words of Moret, all the team had to do now was launch the game before they had to ask for money again. Moraine seems to have meant this more from a business perspective than a literal one, as he has gone on to state in interviews that there were plenty of investors who were willing to give them money at this point, especially since now there was actually some assurance that the game would be made. The problem was, though, that many of these investors were seeking stock in the company in return for their assistance. Moraine was always staunchly against this, mostly because giving away equity in the company meant risking the creative freedom of his team, the very thing that he sought to obtain by going independent in the first place. Moraine felt that, at this stage of production, giving away stock was just not worth a couple extra months of development time. So, in a mad dash to keep their creative independence intact, Red Barrels were again left in a manic state of developing and marketing Outlast right up to the finish line on September 4th, 2013. How's it going, bro? Hello, everybody. My name is Markiplier. Top of the morning to you, laddies. My name is Jack Septicai. Now, I've been waiting for this game for a long time, and I'm sure that many of you have as well. It's one of the uh, a really big upcoming horror titles. This is a game that I think really needs no introduction. A lot of people in the horror scene have been looking forward to this for quite a while, me included. I'm so pumped to play this. It's it's gonna be awesome. This is one of the most anticipated horror games this year. I can safely say that Outlast made me jump out of my chair more often in its four-hour descent into hell than any other game ever has. That is quite the welcoming. This chilling adventure effectively delivers a pervading sense of anxiety and panic never losing sight of the survival component of survival horror. Outlast forces you to be conservative with your resources. Careful planning was essential in order to survive in this world. Outlast can stand proudly as a unique and terrifying survival horror game. To say that the launch of Outlast was a success is accurate, but in a way, it's almost not enough. To limit Outlast to a simple failure slash success metric is to undermine the game's overall importance. Outlast as an idea was an impossibility. The game was an indie, single-player survival horror game. A combination of words that was so repellent to big-time studios that an industry veteran like Moray had to create his own studio and raise his own money just to have a hope of making it. Outlast is the type of game that is designed to stay with you. In fact, Moray once said that until you were thinking about the game as you fell asleep, his job was not truly done. The images and content of Outlast are sure to linger in the minds of everyone who has played the game for years to come, but Moray and company actually achieved something more than this. Outlast is visible not only as you fall asleep, but in new games hitting the market every single day. Even though the game itself is fantastic, the aspect of Outlast that will likely stand the test of time best is not its quality, but instead is its overall influence. Thanks to Outlast, the market once again began to be saturated with single-player action-adventure games, a genre which, before Outlast's release, was in dire need of reinvigoration. Influenced by Outlast's capacity to take the market by storm, games like Wolfenstein, Alien Isolation, and Dying Light started to pop up out of the woodwork, all of which saw major success in a time where developers thought that single-player games were dying. And even if Outlast was not one of the sole influencers of some of these projects and their success, there is still something that has to be said about the foresight of Moraine and company. Their ability to read the way that the market was leaning back into these types of games and to pursue their dream project even when nobody else could be convinced? It's nothing short of a triumph. And really, that's what Outlast is at the end of the day. A triumph. A triumph of game design, a triumph of storytelling, and a triumph of endurance and overcoming the odds. Both of the players and of the developers to complete.